Welcome to another episode of Before You Kill Yourself with your host, Leo Flowers. And that is me, Leo Flowers. How are how are you breathing right now? Are you are your shoulders relaxed? What about your face? I always get a little furrow between my eyes. Uh, I'm never quite, every time I think I'm relaxed, uh, I always notice there's always a, just a slight bit of tension between my eyes. And, and then when I am really relaxed, ah, that, that's the signal that I am 100% in the present moment. Uh, I hope that you feel connected. You can uh, feel your feet on the ground. You, you are, are sending energy into your uh, arms, into your feet, and your legs. Um, I hope that you that you took some time to zoom out. You know, we spend a lot of time in front of our cell phones and iPads, and uh, we don't take time to ca- capture those panoramic visions, those long, distant gazes into the universe. Uh, that's why sunsets and sunrises are so beautiful and engrossing and magnificent to us. Uh, if you have access to a rooftop, it's, you find that you're immediately uh, soothed. I can't even say, I can't say soothed. But uh, I, ho- I hope you're eating well, moving well, and healthy. That's 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 the number one thing right now is just staying healthy and staying with us. Uh, we have a great episode for you today. We have Lindsay Anderson on today's episode, and we talk about a lot of stuff today. Uh, we talk about her managing bipolar two and PTSD and generalized anxiety disorder. So we define bipolar one versus bipolar two. We discuss how she was diagnosed with dysthymia, which is a type of depression, when she was 12. And uh, uh, there's so much talk about depression. Uh, there's not a lot of talk about dysthymia. So we talk about what that is because uh, for a lot of us, we think that we're struggling with depression when really it's dysthymia. Uh, even Abraham Lincoln, they, some people call it melancholy, uh, but it's, it's the same concept. So. Uh, you, you may find out that uh, you've been misdiagnosed with this episode. She talks about how she attempted uh, twice. And we don't, obviously, we don't go into detail about how she attempted, but we do talk about the treatment that she received, how she, how she hospitalized herself. So for some of you who are uh, afraid of hospitalizing yourself, uh, she talks about what that process was and the fact that she's still here. Uh, shows you the effectiveness of it. And obviously it depends on what hospital you go to. And as a bonus, we also talk about how she paid for it. She hospitalized herself for 30 days and uh, it was $28,000. How does she pay for that? So uh, we're going to get into that because that's going to be of value to you. A lot of people aren't seeking help because they think they can't afford it. And she's going to show you how she uh, paid off that $28,000 and it's something that most of you, uh, the listeners, can do, if not all of you. Uh, But you you all have access to this in some way. So uh, listen for that and just how to pay for mental health treatment in general if you uh, don't have insurance. So we're going to get into that. Uh, we talk about how how important it is to share your story because that reduces the stigma of what you're feeling. The more people who share their stories, including you, then the more the easier it becomes for other people to share their story. So sometimes what helps us get better is to not just think about ourselves and what we're going through, but to think about the next generation. Like, can you do something or what can you do today so it makes it easier for the next generation to cope with being bullied, to cope with their uh, mental illness, to cope with the stigma of having attempted or uh, uh, you know self harming uh, themselves. And 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 she talks about her PTSD uh, from being bullied uh, as a kid, and uh, but how she finally got help. And what's beautiful is if you know me, 
you know, I want to live to be 100. That's, that's my goal right there. Um, and she talks about how she got to meet her great-grandparents. A lot of people don't even get to meet their grandparents. She was, her great-grandparents were al- alive long enough for her to meet them. And, uh, and, and li- when lived to be 101. 100. So I asked her what the key was, what she thought was the key to the grandparents living into their 90s and 100s. And then she shares that with us for those of you who want to live a nice, long, healthy life because they lived a, a healthy life. They did, they did, they weren't just a hundred and uh, you know uh, in an infirmary. They they were strong and robust people. And then of course we talk about our favorite books and uh, and all, so many other goodies that I'm sure you're going to enjoy and and how to. She has a website. A little bit about uh, Lindsay Anderson. Uh, is that she is a mental illness advocate and the creator of consciouslycoping.com. So in this episode, we talk about how she, what her coping strategies are when uh, her, to, to regulate her mood so that her bipolar 2 doesn't consume her. Uh, what happened was during a difficult time in her life in 2015, she decided to search for black mentally ill peers via YouTube and was disheartened to find one African-American person. That experience would change her life as she chose to start a YouTube channel and blog to share her personal stories on navigating America as a mentally ill black woman. Uh, Lindsay is a past member of NAMI and DBSA and has been featured on For Harriet, No More Martyrs, and Nielsen Holdings, LLC. Currently, Lindsay is a student studying biology with a minor in applied mathematics and aims to become a postdoctoral research scientist in the field of computational neuroscience. Welcome to the episode, ladies and gentlemen, Lindsay Anderson. And of course, if you have not yet, go check out thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one coaching with yours truly. Uh, a lot of us are struggling with transitions, traumas, tragedies, and I want to share with you my personal coping skills and my self-soothing techniques uh, that I use that can help move you from A to B. Um, go to thrivewithleo.com to work with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. And with that said, let's hop into the episode. So I appreciate you joining me. Where are you out of? Where do you where are you at, Lindsay? I am in Savannah, Georgia, on the East Coast. Oh wow! So you got <laughs> the AC fan bug rip. You got all the things. <laughs> you got ice uh, on the. You got an ice pack. How? <laughs> well, well, no. <laughs> uh, you know, I always say like people in the South, we know like. Just stay home. <laughs> so we just stay home. Like we go nowhere. Like it's hot, it's muggy. Savannah is really humid. So the thing here is like it'll it'll get around about 96, but with the heat index is about 107. And then we have like sweltering sauna like humidity. And that's the issue. And so we all just stay home. Nobody comes outside until like 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. Oh, uh, no, nah, see, I can't do that. And 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 we were thinking about going out to Savannah, Georgia, uh, Savannah, Georgia, because we'd never been and heard how beautiful and you'd like you feel the history. Uh, but I like I don't know if I want to feel that history. You know, it might. <laughs> it, it, it's gorgeous. Like, it's I mean, it's beautiful. The oak trees are gorgeous. The water, the food is great. You know, a lot of history. We have a lot of connection with Charleston, South Carolina. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, history with, you know, the West African culture. So it's great. But I'm just telling you, wear a tank top <laughs> and some shorts and some flip flops and bring a whole bunch of water and ice. So, yeah, I, I, I appreciate it. I'm writing all of those down right now. <laughs> So, Lindsay Anderson, tell me about consciously coping. Like, what, what, what is it, and, and why did you create this? Um, yeah, so um, consciously coping is something that started out of a um, a revenge blog, I guess you can't call it. 
Uh, so at the uh, around about 2011, 2012, I was at the time I was married and I had just had my son. And so I had a lot of mental health issues going on. Right. And so I, my ex-husband and I had a lot of friends that were, you know, they were his friends, but they were also my friends. My friends were kind of also his friends. And so we were really young. Um, and of course, we would vent to our friends, you know, our frustrations with, you know, being married and being parents. Well, I had a lot of social media, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. And I would vent. Now, I wouldn't per se say exactly who or what was going on. But of course, people would, you know, go back and tell my ex-husband, you know, hey, you know, Lindsay posted this. Is this about you? So I started a blog and it was called I'm Depressed, Get Over It. Um, And so it was really a blog for me to prove like, hey, you know, this is what I have going on. Like nobody understands it. I have, you know, all of these mental health issues. Nobody gets it. I want my story to be told. So that point of view, it was great at first. Um, I had a few people that kind of like, oh, this is so good. I understand you. As I grew as a person, I kind of was like, "Uh, this is not something I should be doing. Um, And so in 2015, I was having a I was really struggling Um, at that time. My ex-husband and I got divorced. So we were separated and then actually got divorced. So it really hit me like a ton of bricks. And so I went on YouTube one night. I was really upset. And I just searched black woman with a mental illness. And I found one person. Um, and that really made me upset because I felt like I wasn't the only person that was black and that was a woman that had a mental illness. And so it really bothered me. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. So I started this YouTube channel. Of course, I fall into this like idea of, oh, you know, I need to do makeup and clothes and, you know, get sponsorships. And that fell off. And I was like, you know what? I just want to talk. So I, I started this thing called Transparency Thursday. Every Thursday, I would get on and talk about a tub- subject specifically for mental health. Um, and so it began to grow. I mean, it just grew exponentially. I mean, just out of nowhere. I mean, I was getting DMs and like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I've never heard of anybody talk so openly about their mental health issues. And so I just kept it going. And after I saw there was a need, I decided that I didn't just want to do a blog or just a YouTube channel. I wanted to take it a step further. You know, I wanted to do advocacy work. I wanted to go into the community. I wanted to make films. I wanted to do content creation. Uh, And so, yeah, I start, I was in the car taking my son to school and I was like, what can the name be? Like, it can't be, you know, this anymore. I I need something new. Um, And I was like, what do I do every day? And I'm like, what is it something that we do consciously? And I'm like, I consciously, you know, I'm like rambling off stuff. And all of a sudden it hit me. I'm like, I'm always trying to consciously cope and consciously cope and started. And then it was just a YouTube channel. And now it is a blog. It is a content creation. Um, I do a lot of advocacy work uh, right now, trying to work on some reform. Um, and so really in, in, in its entirety, it is a social media platform that is created and curated specifically for Black Americans navigating the mental health community in America. Um, and so it is a place for people who have mental illnesses to come and thus share their experience. Um, sharing our stories have power. Um, and I believe that the more we share stories, of course, we can diminish stigma. But let, besides stigma, we can create a community. Um, I feel as African-American people, our whole history is based upon how we come together as a familial, communal base, like just society. Um, and that's really important. And that's what got our grandmamas through, right? And our moms and our dads. And so I wanted to create that kind of feeling of people who have mental health conditions or illnesses to come together and share these stories and talk about things that how we cope, you know, how do we get through this? Like, what do I do? I, I don't have all the answers. Can you help me, sister, brother, cousin, friend, internet cousin? 
Um, and so, yeah, it's just grown and uh, I continue to do the work and trying to just implement some new things now and take it to a different level. And now I'm trying to like partner with other organizations um, to really get the word out that our stories have power. And we have to tell, we have to hear our own stories. Uh, when you don't know your own story, you start to believe that things that go on in your life, you deserve it. Um, and so I think it's really important to just kind of keep that conversation going. So that's the long, short version of um, of uh, what Consciously COVID is and kind of why I started it. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, and when you re- talk about mental illness, uh, you're talking about your diagnosis of bipolar 2, PTSD, and generalized anxiety disorder. But it, that wasn't your initial diagnosis, correct? Right. Um, So I've actually been um, managing and navigating through the mental health community since the age of 12. Um, And so I was diagnosed at the age of 12 with dysthymia. Um, And so dysthymia is a is inside of the depression, um, uh, inside of depression as far as like, um, excuse me, major depressive disorder. Now, the difference with major depressive disorder and dysthymia is major depressive um, disorder is something that it, it is a more intense depressive low mood, right? So they like people who have like major depression will have a really intense, really deep, um, really heavy depressive episode. And it, they may experience it like once, maybe every two to five years. However, people with dysthymia are your people who function. So those are the people who kind of go through life every day, always kind of have that low melancholy mood, kind of have that low depressive, you know, not really intense enough to go to a mental health facility. However, they still have that low mood. They can go to work, but then they may go home and curl up on the bed, you know, can't can't take a shower, can't wash clothes, can't, you know, interact with family, don't want to watch TV. Um, and so that's what I was diagnosed with. Um, so I spent, you know, up until about the age of... Oh my gosh, 27, 28, thinking that I just had depression. And so I um, was on every medication, anything you can think of. I mean, I've taken Zoloft, Prozac, I've had Wellbutrin, I mean, the Paxil, I mean, I've done it all. And nothing was working. No, I mean, I, I could, like, I would get on this medication and I kept feeling worse. Um, and so, I went to a mental health facility, a behavioral center, uh, and the psychiatrist there said, I really think that you have bipolar disorder. He said, however, I haven't seen you long enough, so I cannot give you this diagnosis without you being here or seeing someone on a consistent basis. Um, He said, but I really want you to to go to therapy um, and get your therapist to refer you to a psychiatrist so we can get you accurately diagnosed. It would be years (laughs) before I did that. Um, And so more recently, about three, four years ago, I was correctly, accurately diagnosed with bipolar disorder type two. Um, I've always had PTSD, always had the generalized anxiety disorder. Those two disorders I've had since the age of 12. So uh, just getting that bipolar disorder correctly and accurately did wonders. I mean, I saw... Just the treatment plan and, you know, the medication, everything just started to come together. And I actually started to feel better and and get some of that healing done. What happened when you were 12 to cause PTSD? Um, So 12, you know, that's you go to middle school (laughs) Um, and I went to a predominantly, well, I went to a mixed elementary school. I'll say that. Um, However, I was in what was then known as the magnet program. So that's, you know, like the smart kids with the great grades who get honor roll, pretty much a lot of kids with a lot of anxiety. Um, And so I was in that program. And of course I was like maybe one of three black students. Uh, So it was a different type of, you know, just experience that I had until I got to middle school. Well, the middle school I decided to go to was total, total cultural shock. Um, and I just, it was, it was too much. 
I just couldn't relate to the students. I didn't, you know, I, I at the time I was staying with my grandparents um, and they were, I guess at the time you could say they were more affluent. Um, they lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. They had nice cars. They, you know, went on trips. They had multiple properties. So, you know, it was just a different type of lifestyle. And going to this school and, you know, interacting with these students who, you know, we're, kids are going to be kids. And so, immediately I was bullied. Um, everything from my hair, my looks, the way I talked, the way I walked, what I wore. Um, and so it started out as just simply bullying, you know, being different, you know, kids being kids. And it turned into harassment. It turned into violence. It turned into people threatening to fight me and jump me and give me your money and starting rumors. You know, it just kind of escalated. And I did not know how to say, hey, you know, this is what I'm experiencing. How, do, like, what what do I do? What I did was, let me try to fix it. Let me try to blend in. Let me get my hair done like everybody else. Let me wear the same type of shoes and clothes and let me behave differently. Let me change my vernacular. Um, and it never worked. And so the more I, you know, try to be like everyone else, the worst it kind of, like I would kind of always fall short. Um, and so, yeah, I became really depressed. Um, I really kind of went in um, and my behavior really did change. I was a very outgoing child. I loved arts. I loved to draw arts and crafts. I loved to draw and do all these amazing things. Um, and slowly but surely I started to recuse. I started to kind of go within. Um, and my best friend, she tra actually transferred to my middle school with me. And that was in the seventh, by this time I was in the seventh grade. And, you know, she, she was like, something's wrong. And I commend her even to this day. We're still really good friends. She went to the nurse and said, Hey, you know, my friend Lindsay, I don't know what's wrong with her, but like, she's crying all the time. She has bruising. She won't talk to me. She's always saying she doesn't want to be here anymore. I don't know what to do. Um, and thus kind of, you know, everybody kind of stepped in. Um, and so once everyone stepped in, that's kind of when it, it, you know, it was like, what's going on? And of course I was, you know, 12. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to share that information. I didn't want to talk about it. So I just kind of said, oh, I'm okay. I'm just a little down, but I'm okay. Um, and so I kind of wrote it off and played it off like I was all right uh, for a long time. Um, and so, yeah, that's, and it just kind of manifested and just kind of grew into a bigger issue as I got older. All right, so, uh, first of all, I, I want to highlight the fact that your friend stepped in and helped you out. And I want to highlight that because so many people are struggling with something right now, whether it's a mental illness or, or, or even money, job loss, relationships, and we're trying to fix it ourselves. And as you stated, we can't do that. We, it, we are tribal people. We are bred in communities. And, and so sometimes uh, someone takes notice and helps us, and sometimes we have to ask for help. So for those, anybody out there struggling, know that you can't get well alone. You need someone who will help you, and, and maybe the people in your life, and you've tried it before, uh, hasn't worked out, but keep working at it. You will find someone uh, who can help you. Because sometimes when we're depressed, we just think, Everybody uh, is out to get us or uh, uh, won't help us, but there's always someone who is willing, ready, and able. Um, my other question was: You said you live with your grandparents, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what? Why did you? Uh, how come? Why didn't you live with your parents? Why did you have to go to your grandparents? Yeah. So um, my mom and dad were really young <laughs> when they had me. Uh, my mom met my dad actually in college. Um, and at the age of 20, my mom was like, I want to have a baby. And my dad was like, uh, we're like 20 years old. <laughs> and she was like, nope, like, that's what I want to do. And so thus, you know, she got pregnant. They were in college and both. Well, my mom, you know, of course, once she actually had me, uh, got out of college for a brief stint, uh, and she worked. And so my grandmother was like, well, we can help you. You know, like we, you know, don't stress yourself out, like, you know, work, do what you need to do. 
we will take the baby. Um, and so I went, I moved back to Savannah at the age of one and I stayed with my great grandmother. And so I was two and she said I was too much to handle. Um, and then, uh, after the age of two, I moved with my grandparents and I mean, it was, it was great. <laughs> like it, it was great. And it was really, you know, my mom, you know, she was in a, a different city, uh, which is about three hours away. That's where she, her hometown and so she, of course, came on the weekends and, you know, I spent the entire summer there every summer. So, you know, I still had that relationship, but uh, staying with my grandparents just to kind of lighten her load. So she had a lot of support. All of my grandparents were living, including great grandparents when I was born. So that was a great, you know, just a great pillow of support for her. Um, and it worked out. And I'm really thankful for that because I was able to grow up around them and, you know, just kind of learn their ways and learn how to cook certain things and, you know, just learn about like what we did back in the day. So it was really cool. It was a really good experience. When you say great grandparents, how old did your great great grandparents live to? Or I mean, was everybody cranking <laughs> them out at 20? What was what was happening? <laughs> um, so let's see. My dad's mother her mother had her at 16, so she was really young. Um, and then my, let's see, my mom's mom's mom, um, she passed when I was seven, but she was 101. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so some of these people were either really older or they were, like, right at retirement age. So, like, I had, like, a really like one of my great grandparents was like right at retirement. And the other one was like, uh, like 90. So yeah. So I kind of had a kind of big, big gap, but yeah. So, okay. I, because anybody who was listening to who has listened to uh, all the episodes knows that one of my goals is to live to a hundred. What did oh. you learn from your great grandparents about longevity, living life, uh, that you could share with the audience? Um, so I think like both of my great grandmothers, cause my great grandfathers, uh, one passed, so I think when I was born and the other one, um, he passed as well. Like my mom said, like maybe a year or two before I was born. So I really had my great grandmoms. Um, actually all of my great grandmas were still alive. Um, and so I think the biggest thing for me that they all had in common was that, they set boundaries like they said, like when you walked in the room, they had it set like you knew how to respect them. They didn't care how you felt. They didn't care if you got mad. They didn't care if you didn't agree. It was like, look, I am setting boundaries for me. If you don't like it, I mean, that's fine. I still love you. However, this is just not we're not going to do this. And I saw that. Um, especially with my dad's grandmother. Um, and she would go toe to toe with him. You know, she would be like, hey, 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 like, wait a minute. Like, we raised her. Like, you weren't here. You know, like, you can't come in and, and try to give rules and try to be a dictator when you haven't been around. Yes, she is your child. However, we are what she knows, what she knows. And so I remember that. I, I was about, 11 years old. And I remember that conversation to this day. And so I think it was important for me to see that. And she still loved him. Like it was no love loss. Um, he was kind of angry, <laughs> but you know, she was just like, you know, it is what it is. And so I think, you know, seeing her and, and even my, my mom's grandmother, like her just setting that tone and being like, Hey, I'm not tolerating it. Like, this is what it's going to be. We're going to set this tone and that's it. Um, and I think they really showed me, you know, like setting boundaries. And of course, you know, how we talk in our, you know, in our culture is, you know, they were really bossy, but no, they weren't bossy. They were setting boundaries. They were letting you know, you're going to respect me. I deserve respect. I'm worthy of respect and I'm going to get it. And if you don't like that, that's perfectly okay with me. I still love you. You can go about your way and I can go mine. Um, and I think that was really important. And even though I, I have struggled with that, it's something that I still reflect on it. I still joke about my great grandmother, you know, you know, just having that slick mouth and just, you know, setting that boundary and, you know, still being loving, still being like, hey, I cooked dinner. You want to come over and grab a plate? But letting you know, like, I'm not going to tolerate it. You're not going to disrespect me. 
it, it's just, it is what it is. And so I think that was important for me to watch, especially with them being older um, and just them setting the tone, but still showing that love. Like those things can, can still exist. Like you can still, you know, be stern, but you can still be caring. Those things can exist. Um, and that's a part of their mental health. And I think really, that's why they lived so long. That's why they. I was able to say, you know, hey, they passed when I was in my 20s. Uh, I, I, of course, my mom's gr- uh, grandmother passed when I was seven. But, you know, my dad's grandmother lived till and I was in my 20s. So, you know, I was able to see her and, and she still lived that life until the day she died. It was like, hey, I'm setting this, this boundary and either you can get with it or, you know, <laughs> you can kind of get gone. Uh, but I think it was really important and it just helped me see like eat as now as I continue to heal that, you know, stress, the, the cliche saying is stress can kill you and it really can. Um, and so you have to take care of yourself. Like you have to be here. You want to see your grandchildren, you know, you want to see your great grands, you want to see, you know, your family be successful. Then your goal is to be here. And so what are things that are going, that are going to keep you here? What are things that are going to keep you to longevity? You know, physical health is a huge, I mean, it's very important. You know, what you put in your body is extremely important, but it's also about the negative thoughts you put into your body. It's also the thoughts of other people that you put into your mind. And so those things also affect us as well. And I think that if we can kind of remember that and keep that connection of, it's not just what we eat, but it's really how we take care of our mind, how we massage our brain, you know, how we keep our mind, you know, active and, you know, challenge our mind and keep it up to this best ability uh, that's extremely important so I think that was like that was their thing like hey I'm not I'm not here for it either you're gonna take it or you're gonna leave it I, I, I love that you know my mom said the same thing I was asking her because my mom's from Belize my dad's from Alabama and my mom is definitely my dad passed away but my mom definitely gonna live to be a thousand uh, she's 69 and she beat COVID with ginger ale and, and, and like a hot toddy or something, uh, wow. recently. And I, I, I'm exaggerating, but she, she, she's a fighter, but she did, uh, she did beat COVID. Um, the, but when I asked her about, uh, race and dealing with racism, cause she used to work at a bank, uh, in Chicago for about 30 years. And I'm like a black woman at a bank in Chicago. Uh, she had to experience some things, and 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 when I look back, she never talked to us about race. It was always about respect. About I look you in the eye, you look me in the eye, and and if if you can't do that, then I I don't want nothing to do with you. So she she was for her it was never about color or uh, how much money you made or or where you're from. It was always about the respect. And, you know, I I swear people meet my mom and, and she has the life. 